was released for the Super Famicom in 1993, a year after Puyo Puyo hit arcades in 1992. Due to the extra time, the game ended up receiving some more polish. Through a button combination, it's possible to enter a special custom menu that features a slew of options. But if you utilize this action replay code, it's possible to unlock a few more choices, notably the SOSI or offsetting rule. Normally in OPP, offsetting isn't possible and any garbage will fall into your field regardless. But with this rule turned on, you're able to neutralize the garbage, predating its defining debut in Puyo Puyo Tsu the following year. And since Kirby's Avalanche is the localized version of Super Puyo Puyo, this release also features the Sosai rule, locked behind the same circumstances, even down to the same action replay code. You might have noticed this hard option as well. This allows you to turn on garbage Puyo that require two clears to remove, just like the hard Puyo that would later appear in the series, though these are significantly more evil looking and like in Tsu, cause the screen to shake when they fall. Though, they don't immediately clear if two or more Puyo are removed adjacent to it. From a technical standpoint, this release is also interesting because the Super Famicom's internal resolution is far less than the Mega Drive, so Compile compromised by placing the character portraits in the playfield instead of the center of the screen. If you've messed around with Sega Age's Puyo Puyo Tsu at all, you may have noticed there's some characters in the pause menu that don't seem to appear in the game. This is because they will only appear if you manage to clear all of the opponents on a floor without leveling up, which is very difficult. You can simulate this through the Endurance mode, which is unique to the Sega Ages release, though I just used a Game Genie code on the Mega Drive version of the game instead. Owlbear is the secret opponent on the second floor, Zombie for the third floor, Dragon for the fourth, and Zodaimo for the fifth. It's kind of a shame, because their sprite art is really nice and well animated. Zo even has his signature screen shake carried over from OPP. Masked Satan can be fought if you manage to beat everyone on the first floor, though he can more easily be encountered if you clear the game with no continues and a score above 180,000. If you're wondering about Carbuncle, he's not an actual opponent in this version of the game, but his sprite work is lifted from Puyo Puyo Box which was kind of like the sonic jam of Puyo Puyo, featuring ports of OPP and Tsu, along with a full RPG mode giving a nod to the series' dungeon crawling roots. There's also a rally mode featuring all of the rule sets and characters up to Puyo Puyan, with the newer characters' artwork redrawn to match the Tsu art style. There's also a treasure mode, which might look familiar as it ended up being adapted in 15th anniversary as Excavation. Since we're on the topic of Puyo Puyo Tsu, this game introduced the all-clear mechanic, known in Japan as Zenkishi. The little jingle that accompanies the all-clear is not unique to Puyo Puyo. It's actually featured throughout many compiled games, notably a few of their shmups as the extra life sound effect. Heck, it's even in OPP, likely as a holdover from Musha Alest, as they share a lot of sound resources. The fact that this jingle is still used today just shows how much Puyo Puyo has absorbed the legacy of Compile, even after their bankruptcy. I guess that's a story worth diving into, huh? So, Compile is the original developer and creator of Puyo Puyo. After the release of the original game, Sega wanted to partner up and bring Puyo Puyo to their System C2 arcade hardware. With the new focus on multiplayer, it was quite popular in arcades, but the series didn't become a phenomenon until Tsu, which refined the gameplay so well it became a competitive masterpiece. With great success comes merchandising, and after a couple of years milking Puyo Puyo, Compile ended up flying too close to the sun and made some poor investment decisions, giving them no choice but to file for bankruptcy in 1998. Trusting Sega, Compile entered an agreement to let them pawn the rights of the franchise until they could buy it back, though unfortunately Compile was never able to recover. So that's why Sega's copyright information started to show up on Puyo games published on other platforms, like Pocket Puyo Puyo Sun for the Game Boy Color, and Puyo Puyan for the PlayStation 1, despite Sega, Sony, and Nintendo still being competitors at the time. This makes things tricky these days, as Sega only holds the rights to Puyo Puyo, not Mado Manokatari. 
This basically means that Compile Heart, one of Compile's successors, can create dungeon crawling RPGs under the Mado name, but they can't use any of the characters that appeared in Puyo Puyo. Let's go! Since I brought up the Teal Puyo in the last video, a couple of people wanted me to talk about the Chu Puyo, which was featured in Puyo Puyo Fever 2 in the elusive Endless Chu Panic Mode. Essentially, they're just a glorified garbage Puyo shaped like lips, likely only added to bring significance to the pun featured in the game's title, which is the onomatopoeia for kissing in Japanese, which sounds like the English pronunciation of two. Actually, a lot of the titles of Puyo games are puns, starting with su, which means expert in Japanese, but also sounds like the English number two. Sun sounds like the number three in Japanese, san. Puyo Puyan, where they simply added an N sound at the end, phonetically adding yan into the title, which is the number four in Japanese. Fever, which is just close to five structurally. In Japanese, fever is pronounced fiba, which I think sounds kind of like five. And yeah, that makes Fever 2 5 2 instead of 6. And it is canonically Puyo Puyo 6, since the tagline for this game was Zuto Yume Chu, or roughly Always Dreaming of Chu. If you combine the kanji of Yume with Naka, there's another reading Mu Chu, which also means to be dreaming or in a trance state. Mu is one way to pronounce 6 in Japanese. This pun was later referenced in Puyo Puyo Quest by one of Sig's alts, featuring his design from this game. The card's name is Muchu Nashigu, and his active skill is Zutto Muchu, referencing the wordplay. And with Puyo Puyo 7 being the last mainline title, there doesn't seem to be a pun at all. Though one of the many teasers for this game was What's Mean 247? You might notice Puyo fans referring to Puyo as 24. This is because 2 can be read as Fu, and 4 can be read as Yo. Put them together and you get Fuyo, which is pretty close to Puyo. So 247 is Puyo 7. This is also why Hatsune Miku is associated with the number 39, as 3 can be read as Mi, and 9 can be read as Ku. Speaking of Hatsune Miku, Puyo Puyo has made quite a few cameo appearances, even gaining a full crossover in Project Mirai DX as Puyo Puyo 39. See what they did there? In this mode, you're pitted up against one of the five other Vocaloids, each of which has their own unique spells and animations. This mode also features a unique Puyo skin, Mirai, which sort of resembles the gummy skin that would later appear in Puyo Puyo Chronicle. You can unlock special outfits for clearing this mode, like Kaito has a costume featuring the Dark Prince's attire, and Hatsune Miku has a costume for Arl's. If you put on the Arl outfit, Miku will even use some of Arl's spells and animations. In Project Diva Future Tone, Rin has a module that allows her to dress up as Arl. Additionally, Amity's hat in Ringo's Beret were added as downloadable accessories in the third Encore DLC pack. Hatsune Miku and friends would also appear in Puyo Puyo Quest, including even Miku Dayo and Snow Miku. We've now received the third batch of DLC for Puyo Puyo Tetris 2, and like last time, I'd like to give more insight on the newly added characters. Legamont and Rosate both debuted in Puyo Puyo Quest. I haven't played that many gacha mobile games, so excuse the limited analogy, but essentially they're the gala characters of the game called Puyo Fest. What that means is they're extremely powerful but have a low appearance rate to encourage you to spend, spend, spend all your money. <clears throat> Puyo Puyo Quest has many series of which there's a ringleader, so to speak, dubbed a lore fest. Rosate is the lore fest of the Warlock series, which features a group of wizards that he takes mentorship of, while Legamunt is the lore fest of the Heavenly Knights, being their strongest member. Though maybe I should use the word member loosely, as he prefers to work alone due to losing someone dear to him in his past. You may have recognized some of these characters from their unlockable icons in Puyo Puyo Tetris 2. Hartman is notable because he was playable in Puyo Puyo Champions, but now the torch is being passed to Legamunt. And since we're talking about champions, Ciel is from the Angel series, Head is from the Devil series, Sultana is from the Jin series, Alex is from the Fairy Tale series, and Peng Lai is from the Dragon Person series. 
Paprisu, the other secret character in this game, is kind of the mascot of Puyo Puyo Quest. Their name is a combination of the word pepper and risu, which means squirrel in Japanese. According to the 2019 Halloween Manzai, Paprisu are capable of speaking normally and actually hate saying <laughs> So I guess they're just trolling in Champions? Oh, I should probably mention Valkyrie Arl as well. She isn't so much of a secret character, rather she's more like an alternate costume for Arl. She also originates from Quest, as the first Puyo Fest added to the game. To be frank, I'm unfamiliar with either of these characters, because their only previous existence was Puyo Puyo Quest, so the lore is kinda nebulous for me. With that being said, most of Legamont's spells are the name of swords featured throughout mythology. Graham! Caliburnus! Kalacho! Kraden! Levitine! Expecting something else? And Rosate's spells are, well, spells, spoken in Latin. Gratis Adventus, Spirea Generosa, Phantasma Floreo, Grimoire Infatus, Gladio Incantantus. Not even close. Ragnus made his debut in Puyo Puyo's Sun and is considered the light counterpart to Shezo, the Dark Mage. He suffers from a curse that causes his body to fluctuate between a young man and a child, though he can recover by gaining experience from clearing Puyo. It's notable that this isn't his first Western debut, as he appeared in Puyo Pop for the Game Boy Advance, though he was referred to as Lagnus here. These days it appears his age gimmick has been shelved, though his child form did make an appearance in Puyo Puyo Quest as his 3 star rarity artwork. Also, his old voice in the Japanese audio is a lot deeper, which could be a nod to his curse. Ragnus' spells are stereotypical JRPG magic and sword strike attacks. Slash! Combo attack! Take this! Mega Rave! Ultimate Blow! Counter attack! Harpy made her debut as an opponent in the original Puyo Puyo, though she was conceived as an enemy in Mado Manakatari first, with a drastically different appearance. As a Harpy, her singing is... great. Back in the day, Compile created original video animations distributed through their bi-weekly Disc Station magazine, one of which features Harpy getting upset with Sara Lee for singing poorly, and starts instructing her on how to sing properly, despite being tone deaf herself, and effectively starts ruining Sara Lee's beautiful vocalization. And like Sara Lee, she also appeared in Puyo Pop for the Game Boy Advance, though her technical Western debut was in Puyo Pop for the Neo Geo Pocket Color. Oh, and real quick, Jaden the Mew pointed out that the capsule skin originally debuted in this version of the game. Neat. Going back to Harpy, she just seems to be warming up her voice for her spells. What? Should I sing? I wonder. For now. La la la! Encore! Puyo Pop Fever was released on quite a few systems in its prime. While I haven't played every version, here's a few details that I've noticed personally. The Dreamcast port is the last first party title for the system and allegedly is the most accurate to the arcade version, since the Naomi hardware operates on similar frequencies to the Dreamcast. There's actually a way to change the Dreamcast's BIOS menu to an alternate 3D mode by installing a VMU save file through the in-game menu. Despite the Dreamcast port never leaving Japan, the English localization is on disc and even changes the logo on the VMU. The PS2, Xbox, and GameCube versions feature a 3D playfield. I personally find it pretty distracting, and for whatever reason, or at least with the GameCube version, the movement just feels stiff. These are my least favorite versions of the game. The GameCube controller is just not meant for puzzle games, especially with that terrible D-pad. The Game Boy Advance version, which was only released in Japan and Europe, is a technically impressive and extremely faithful port. I find this version to be my go-to because it just loads fast and it feels really good. Like, button inputs just feel incredibly responsive and the game tempo is so much faster. 
The Game Boy Advance is also region free, so there's nothing stopping you from importing this one. There isn't too much to note, though due to a bug in the console versions of Puyo Pop Fever, Dapper Bone's second spell animation goes unused except in this version and the DS port. And let's talk about that DS port, because it is something special. You know how early DS games stuffed interactable nonsense everywhere just to take advantage of the new hardware? Well, Sega went guns blazing here, as the entire game can be played with touch controls. There's also far more subtle additions, like on the title screen you can blow into the microphone to make a Puyo appear, but if you tap underneath you can try and keep it from falling. The game even takes track of your score. There also appears to be some kind of minigame in the credits, because I kept getting a miss message when I was tapping on the screen, but I couldn't figure it out. They also added new artwork to the bottom screen during cutscenes, and they're usually interactable, like Liddell's hair buns. Oh, and there's an overworld map that features some beautiful artwork, along with actual names for each location. There's also cute little unique sprites of Amity and Rafina. You can even yeet them around or blow them away. During a match, you can also blow into the microphone to do this. I'm, 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 I'm so cool. There's also character portraits on the bottom screen featuring completely new artwork, some of which are drawn in a slightly different style. Like, look at Daddy Frankenstein here. He's so buff. Inconsistency aside, they look really good. But my favorite feature is that you can play through the story mode paths with any character, so long as you input this button combination. And last but not least, the PSP version is the one I'm the most familiar with since it was the version of the game that got me into Puyo Puyo. Unfortunately, it was only released in Europe and Japan, but the PSP is region free, so there's nothing stopping you from importing it. This version is just a faithful port of the arcade release, but Sega decided to be unique by allowing two players to battle on one device. It's not exactly intuitive, but it's the thought that counts. I also tend to use this version for footage because it's in widescreen. Okay, there's also a PC port that was only released in Japan that featured online multiplayer, but it was restricted to those that owned legitimate copies of the game. Due to these limitations and a lack of a way to play Puyo Puyo online for Western fans, Hernan, who is known for his work on Momodora and is the CEO of Lucky Cat Games, created Puyo Puyo vs which was a freeware Puyo Puyo game with online multiplayer. This was kind of the only way to play online until Puyo Puyo Tetris made the series accessible to Western fans in 2017. Puyo Puyo 20th Anniversary was also a multi-platform release, but I'd like to focus on the 3DS version. This port is unique because it features the ability to use the 3DS's camera to take photos and implement them as backgrounds, or to even create a custom skin for your Puyo. But this isn't the feature I want to talk about. Instead, I want to bring light to the few visual enhancements. Like Arl's victory animation was updated, so it looks like she's waving. Or like the Manzai animations for Draco Centauros, where they made her far more expressive by animating her wings and arms. However, there is one case of an animation downgrade in this version, specifically Papoy here, who runs the in-game shop. In all other versions, his tail actually features unique keyframes, but in the 3DS port, they're removed. I'm guessing they made this change because it was inconsistent with the art style, because no other animation in this game featured manually drawn in-between frames. It's also possible for characters to utilize their classic voice patterns. If you hold a specific button combination while selecting the OPP, SU, or SUN rule set, characters that appeared in either of these games will utilize their old spell patterns based on the game mode selected. Since the Dark Prince appeared in all three, his are actually unique for both OPP and SU slash SUN. <laughs> <laughs> Additionally, the fever theme in this game is a remix of the title screen from the Game Gear version of Puyo Puyo. Another remix of this song also appears on the title screen if you wait long enough.
Let's end this off with some corrections to the last Puyo Puyo trivia video. The unused adult artwork of Klug is a hoax. Thank you to Xcower for investigating this. The artwork comes from a Nico Nico video, which is notable because it features artwork for other character forms that don't exist in the final release, such as the adult form of the Dark Prince, which has him donning his mask from his secret fight in Puyo Puyo Tsu, along with artwork for characters that don't appear at all, like Liddell. It's a shame, because these are really cool, Regardless, Possessed Klug is still Klug's adult form, so my original point still stands. The humanoid skin is in the MSX2 version of Puyo Puyo. Thank you again to Xcower for sharing this information. If you hold I on the keyboard before entering the main menu, you can make use of this skin. The reason I assumed it wasn't in this game was due to a lack of a sprite rip on the spriter's resource. But since it's locked behind this input, who would have guessed? But it's really cool that this exists. There's also an incredibly cursed carbuncle skin if you hold T instead. And lastly, some additional information has surfaced for the English localization of Puyo Puyo. Thank you to Mod on Twitter for this discovery, and a few people that brought it to light in the comments. According to this segment from the Compile Club Underground magazine, this employee claims to have watched a tape of the localization, but did not have a direct hand in its involvement. They also claim that this version of Puyo Puyo originates from Spain, which could possibly explain why Arl was renamed to Silvana. At the bottom of the image, you can see that they're reflecting on the name changes, which completely aligns with the localized Puyo Puyo ROM. There's also a segment in All About Puyo Puyo Tsu, where Kengo Morita, the artist on OPP, makes mention of a European Puyo Puyo that features a black harpy, renamed Dark Angel for religious reasons, and Panati being renamed to Johnny, which aligns with the previous image. Additionally, when Sega Age's Puyo Puyo was released in Japan, Sega and M2 participated in an interview with GameWatch with Sega producer Reiko Kodama revealing that she personally looked around the Sega warehouse for the English arcade board to no avail. Afraid it was lost forever, Sega supervisor Yosuke Okanari then reached out to Eric Showtime Chung, the CEO of Exa Arcadia, a company devoted to creating arcade games on a dedicated hardware platform, similar to the Neo Geo, to see if they possibly had the game in their personal collection. Surprisingly, they did, and they let Sega borrow it to make their own ROM dump. Sega also admits it has no documentation on its development or distribution, effectively making the Sega Ages release a miracle. Hey, thanks for watching my video! Like last time, let me know if I got anything wrong, or if you know any cool trivia yourself, tell me in the comments below. And okay, thank, thank you, goodbye now!